Welcome back to Telemetry Overlay. In this tutorial, we're going to see some advanced topics like gauge controls, custom gauges so you can pick a visual style and then select the data that it will display, patterns or presets, expanding visible data so a short video shows data for a long activity, multiple types of timers, static images and titles, animating image files based on the data, other special gauges like custom on off dynamic text or stats, the general settings of the program, doing synchronization with LTC audio, advanced gauge options like interpolation, the sections of the program, trimming projects to select only a section of them, working with standard video editors like Premiere, Resolve or Final Cut, the video less mode to create telemetry overlay projects without a video, just a data file like a GPX or a Garmin Fit file, creating compatible custom CSV files from any data source, how to use the export queue, some thoughts on basic video editing within the program, how to join non-consecutive videos as a single output video with data, and how to batch load multiple videos to make your work faster. If you're only interested on some of these topics, check their timestamps in the video description. If you're watching this, we're assuming you have a general knowledge of the program. Otherwise, please watch the general tutorial or one for your activity like drones, motorsports, aviation and so on and know that there are other specific tutorials on certain topics like exports, synchronization, maps, 360 video work and recording a GPS signal. The program keeps evolving, so some topics of this tutorial might become outdated. Make sure to check the updated manual, consult the Facebook group or use the included email support. Ok, so you already know that you can load multiple presets from the bottom left Patterns tab. Maybe this should be renamed as Presets in the future. This will give you a general idea of the gauge styles available and you can use them to learn how each gauge is set up. You can click on a gauge and from the top right options, delete it. Reset it to its original state, which is not necessarily the same as what's saved in the pattern. Move it to the top in case some other gauge is covering it. Duplicate it to make a second version with different features. Lock it in place so you don't accidentally move it and hide it to save it for later. You can adjust its size and change its title, which by the way can be displayed from the Labels tab. You will also be able to change the colors of each of its elements and also near the top we've got some more visual controls. I encourage you to experiment with this for example, let's see how the custom digital gauge has some very different variants. Below we have value controls. Most gauges will have a units control, so you can choose units based on your region or preferences. And then every gauge has more specific controls for other purposes. For example, let's create a custom scope gauge and display the altitude data with it. Let's tune it visually. And this will display a graph of the data over time in a time window that moves with the video. So the max control typically means the max value of the graph or gauge. Min is obviously the minimum value. Offset displaces all the values by the same amount. Invert turns the data upside down. And constraint prevents any value from going beyond the mean and the max. Other gauges will have controls like factor, which multiplies all the values by a certain amount. And most gauges have a smoothing control. This computes the average of every sample with the surrounding ones, so that small inaccuracies in the data are mitigated. In some cases, like the slope gauge, You will also see a measure control. 
This is telling the program how far we want the selected samples to be in order to calculate the slope, the heading, or whatever value we are computing. A small measure distance will be very sensitive to small changes and also to small inaccuracies, but bigger distances might miss out on important details in the data. In this case, looking at the altitude graph, we see how the slope should go down if we use a small measure distance, and it does, and the slope should go up if we use a large one. And it does. Finding the best values for smoothing and measure controls will depend on many factors. For example, the quality of our data. As these controls are typically used to reduce inaccuracies, it will depend on the source of our data or its frequency. A high frequency will need more smoothing than a low one and the type of activity we are doing. If we're walking, we will probably want to measure things over a small distance. If we're on a race car, we will want larger distances. Smoothing and measure are subjective to some extent, so you may need to do some trial and error. Of course, not all the controls are covered here, but placing your mouse over a control will explain what it does. At this point, you should also know that you can search for gauges in the add gauge search box. So for example, this would be image related gauges or gauges that contain speed, and you can select them by group, activity, or style. So let's have a look at the custom group and let's clean up things for clarity. Custom gauges are special because they allow you to select a style and then pick the data stream you want it to display. So here we see the available streams and some values are nested. For example, altitude and speed are typically nested within GPS. Let's quickly see some of the custom gauge styles. We've got circular, compass, completion, digital, gradient, mini, positive negative, Scope, Tape, Tilt, Value in Range, Versus Time or Versus Distance, and some more. All of these have a vast number of visual controls that you can use to tweak them and make them look completely different. Let's go back to one of the preset patterns and see how you can display even more data options with custom gauges. We'll go to the top right general settings and enable read extra streams. Then the next time we import a data file or reinterpret it, when we create a gauge, for example custom mini, we will have a series of data streams that the program doesn't read by default. These are generally more technical, but interesting in many use cases. Let's pick internal camera temperature, for example, and place it where it looks fine. We're using the mouse here to drag gauges from their center. Or we can use the keyboard arrows as well. Let's remove decimals and pick a different icon for the mini gauge. Once we are happy with our gauge layout, we'll go to the bottom left pattern section and save our work as a pattern. For example, digital and temperature. This allows us to reuse our gauge layout in a different project. So when we are on a different project, we'll go to the bottom left pattern section, load pattern. We can optionally preserve existing gauges and project styles, but that's not usually what we want and we will select the file we just saved. And it's done. If you wanted this layout to apply to every new project you create, you can go to the general settings on the top right, scroll down to default pattern, and instead of selecting one of the preset ones, you would choose custom pattern, and again select your file. And from now on, every one of your projects will start with this layout. Now that we are on a cycling project, let's see how to make gauges display data for a longer activity than the video. As you can see, 
we have the video data from the GoPro and the feed data from the cycling computer, which will typically be longer than the video. And the video is only displaying data for the video section, not the entire activity. For example, the distance. And this will also affect gauges like the GPS path. What you can do is click on every one of the affected gauges and from its right side controls, enable the expand visible data option. This shows us the entire distance and the entire route in the GPS path, even if our position in the map only covers what happens in the video. Let's now see how to create timers. There are many gauges that can display time data, and probably the most basic one is the time and date gauge. By default, it will display the time of the day and the date. Let's restyle it a little bit. But if you want it to work like a timer or a stopwatch, you can go to the Trim Timer tab on the bottom left and set timer start and timer end points. This video is a crash test, where a cart starts accelerating and then zap, crashing into another one. So we might want to measure the time the car spends accelerating. Let's look for the moment it starts moving. And I'm using the arrow keys to move frame by frame. And we'll set the timer start point here. Then look for the precise frame it crashes. And set the timer end. We'll remove the date and the hours as we don't need them anymore. And indeed the timer starts when the car starts moving and we can know the total time by the time it crashes. You could fine tune these moments with the sliders or disable the trim points to bring back the time of the day functionality. Another interesting option is countdown. If you enable it, there will be a countdown before the timer start point. Something important to note with time data is it may be changing in real time or in data time. In this case, because we're working with a time-lapse video, time is progressing in real time for us, but it's not displaying how time actually evolved while we were recording. So we'll duplicate the gauge scroll down to the value controls and instead of real time we'll want GPS time only. And that reflects reality much better. The same applies to time of the day. For time lapses we may need to adjust this setting to GPS time only. Another type of timer is based on speed. It's called zero to speed and it typically measures the time it takes for a vehicle to reach a certain speed. We can tell it at which speed it should start counting and the speed it needs to reach. And it makes the calculations automatically. We could change it to metric units and measure the time to 100 km per hour. Of course, in motorsports, we will use lap timers. This is covered in more detail in the motorsports tutorial, but basically it needs a closed circuit, a finish line, and repeated passes over that finish line. And as you can see, it displays the best lap and differences between them. A similar one is the sector times gauge. And because we can set multiple sector markers in different points of the track, like so, we can use it to measure both the difference between repeated passes over such markers or to compute times on multiple points of an open circuit. It doesn't strictly need to repeat itself. Again, it shows differences, in this case positive and negative. It's worth mentioning the corner speech gauge as well. It's not a timer, but it works the same way. So we would set some markers and see the difference in speed between multiple passes. 
In some activities, we want to know the time it took us to do a certain distance, for example, every kilometer or every mile, and we can do that with the distance timer. Here we see the time for each quarter mile, as if they were laps. And again, the activity here is longer than the video, so we can expand the visible data and display the entire activity. This is too much data for our screen, so we can choose not to display all laps, just the latest 10, the best one, and the current one. We can also change the units and the distance we want to measure. These would be our times for every kilometer. Finally, with some data sources, we have a time reference included. If that is the case, we can create a custom mini gauge and select our time data source. Here, we have the bike computer time because we enabled the read extra streams setting. We can restyle the gauge by changing the icon and aligning to the right. And this is the time data based on the bike computer. So to recap, we've got the time and date gauge for manual timer with the option of a countdown. We've got zero to speed to measure the time it takes us to reach a certain speed, especially in motorsports. We've got the lap timer strictly for closed circuits. We've got sector times for closed circuit sections or open circuits. The distance timer to measure repeating distance segments. And custom mini to display other sources of time. We will now see static gauges. These allow us to display things that do not change with the data, like titles, comments, or static images. This would be a static title, which we can edit from the top right controls. In this case, streaming will determine how long it displays. So if we just want to display it for a couple of seconds, we'll go to that point in the data and trim it out. It disappears, but if that's too abrupt, from the shape controls, we can create a fade out. and maybe a fade-in as well. So it comes in and goes slowly. Just to see some options, from ticks you could create an underline. And the static image gauge works similarly, but you need to select an image file from your computer. For example, a logo, an icon, or a watermark. And again, you can fade it in, fade it out, and trim it so it only shows when you want it. And now that we are on the topic of images, let's see images that do change with the data. And this will allow you to get really creative. As an example, let's pick the distance image gauge, select the cyclist icon, and restyle it a bit so the ticks look like a minimalistic road. We can reposition the icon with the gauge anchor point, and as you can see, the image progresses over time with the data. Other interesting options would be image lean angle or rotating image. In that case, we will select the orientation data, choose bank, to display the motorcycle tilt. We'll choose a motorcycle icon. Maybe remove the value as we just want the visualization. And here it is important that in the values controls, the mean and max values match the expected values in our data. So 180 positive to 180 negative. 
and allow the gauge to move exactly the same range from minus to plus 180. And again, we can tweak the anchor. So the motorbike rotates exactly from the wheel. And that looks fine. Pretty impressive what motorcyclists do. There are other options like progress image or scaling image that will change each size based on the data. Let's see some more special gauges. For example, custom on off. Because here the skier was using a Proterran data tracker, we've got plenty of interesting data streams. For custom on off, an interesting one could be speed difference. It will show us whether we're faster or not. And the color changes accordingly. Red is up, it means positive or faster. And that's based on our threshold. In this case, zero. So positive will be up and negative will be down. It might make sense to change positive to green. And we can pick different gauge styles. For example, a switch that goes on off. Or use the text itself for displaying the color. And here it will make sense to disable the off light. So it's like an LED turning on when we're going faster. And this would be useful for many other data types. Another particular gauge is custom stats. Let's pick the GPS speed for this one. Let's pick metric units. And it's showing us the minimum, average and maximum speed so far. It could also display the current one the session minimum, session average, and session max, and the current value as a percent of the maximum. Finally, dynamic text will allow us to display text-based streams that cannot be represented by numbers. Here we've got the computed turn directions. The controls look a bit like a mini gauge. So we can display the title as well and see how it changes based on the skewer direction. We will now see an overview of the general settings. First, we've got directories where you can select where your default exports will go and where the project will save cache, temporary files. It is very important that these folders exist in your system and that they are easily available for the program. So external drives or especially cloud drives like OneDrive are not ideal, that could lead to crashes. It's not a bad idea to delete cache every now and then, especially after you have finished some large project. You can overwrite previous exports, but that's generally not the best idea. Below that, we've got units, where you can select your general preset, like metric or imperial, and some variations like nautical or American that will affect certain gauges. Regardless of your preferences here, gauges will still have units controls. Then we've got guides. You can create a grid for example, to follow the rule of thirds and position gauges accordingly. Or you could create a square grid with more density. Or a title and action safe area, which is probably something a bit outdated, but it used to be useful in TV productions. We've already seen how to use patterns. And the map box section is useful for customizing your map styles, but there's a specific maps tutorial that shows how to get started on this topic. Near the bottom, we can see advanced options. This is a long list and many of them are only necessary in very specific cases. So instead of going through each case, 
Just know that you can hover the mouse on each one and it will tell you what it does. And some of them are marked with red or orange colors, so you realize that they may have bad consequences. In many cases, when you encounter a problem with your data, make sure none of these red or orange options are enabled. We also have optimization resolution and process. This only affects the preview within the program, not your final export. So don't obsess over them, but you can experiment with them and see what gives you the best performance. The gauge update rate topic is covered in the exports tutorial. Just know that it is the frame rate of the gauges compared to that of the video. So if our video is 60 FPS and we choose a gauge update rate of half, our gauges will update 30 times per second. Usually half or quarter look perfectly fine and they make your exports much faster. We will get to LTC audio in a second. And at the bottom, we've got the debug code, which usually you will only need if support tells you to use it. But the instructions manual also explains some uses for it. And now back to LTC audio. LTC or linear timecode is a technique for encoding time data in an audio signal. See this video, for example. This annoying audio contains accurate time and date data. It was recorded by plugging a compatible LTC audio generator to the camera. This means we can use the accurate date and time signal to synchronize external data to the video with high precision. You can achieve this by plugging an iPhone with the ProTerm Clock app to your camera via an audio cable or by using a dish device. There are other options, but you will need to check if the data they record is compatible with the telemetry overlay LTC audio formats. Then you'll go to the general settings of telemetry overlay and select the type of LTC audio signal. For the ProTerm Clock app, the default is atomic. Then we import our video as normal, and in the optimization and parsing process, three things happen. One, the video is optimized for preview as usual. Two, the audio data is parsed as a date and time stream. And three, the annoying audio gets silenced. So in the telemetry section, we've got the LTC source, and we can display timestamps from it. So when we go and import external data, no more synchronization work needed. It is already in sync with the video. The ProTerm website has additional documentation on this topic. Check links in the video description. Another interesting general setting is advanced gauge options. The main difference we see now is we've got a resync option that allows us to adjust sync of one gauge independently. This is only necessary if all other gauges are in sync, but one is showing an offset for some reason. And the other one is interpolate. To better see what that does, let's create a custom scope gauge with cadence data, for example. If we look for quick data changes, we will see how by default the program creates a smooth transition between values. But if we disable interpolate, the data changes suddenly, which in some cases might be more realistic or more accurate. Let's bring back the cycling pattern. We've been seeing some of the top right options, but let's see what they all do. We've got the general settings, then the help section with the full updated manual, tutorials like this one, control buttons and especially keyboard shortcuts, the export queue, which we will see in a second, an option to create a new project, so every time you start working on a new video, you would use that. Save project to save your work on the current video. Open project to continue work on a previously saved video. And technical tips or warnings and information about updates. On the left, we've got the initial video section where you can see the video you loaded, but also you can replace it with a new version of the same video. For example, the same video with color correction or with better resolution. And this is important. This is not to be confused with loading a different video and trying to reuse the same gauge layout. For that, you've got the new project button on the top right and the pattern features we've seen before. So let's demonstrate what this does. We've got the original video and a color corrected version of the exact same video. Here we are warned again that this is not to create a new project. And as you can see, the data is still the same. We just have the color corrected footage. 
and both the original GoPro data and feed activity are present. Other options in the telemetry section would be to add a new external telemetry file. We've got buttons to reload or delete a data source and a green one to move a data source to the top. Being at the top means that is the preferred data source for new gauges. So you want the best source on top. For example, let's create a new speedometer gauge. And it is indeed based on the feed data. We can still manually change it to the GoPro data source, but in this case the camera didn't pick up a GPS signal, so it's not very useful. When applying a pattern, the same happens. Preset gauges are based on the preferred data source. Also from the top left, we've got the project section. You can change things like the project name, the resolution, which doesn't affect much most gauges, but it does with those that contain map images. You can also change the frame rate, which is usually not the best idea unless if you're exporting a transparent video and want to save on file size and export time. You can reorient the footage in case it wasn't recorded upright. And here is a default color section. This will only affect new gauges, so let's try a couple of crazy changes. And create one like this speedometer. It will have those colors, but existing gauges will not change. Shadows make elements, especially text, stand out more. But an alternative is to use a border of any color. Below we see fonts, where you can change between included ones and most of the fonts in your system. Standard ones change most gauges, and the monospace font affects mostly minimal gauges. If you want minimal gauges to have a non-mono space font, you can go to the general settings and enable that option. Any font as mono. And now all the same fonts are available for mini gauges as well. Note that some particular gauges that are highly designed are not really affected by font changes or even color changes. Finally, you can create drawers of any color to highlight gauges with a partial background. On the bottom left, we've got trim controls. This will reduce the length of our project to the specified section. We've got buttons on the left and right side to help you with precision. Hover on them and see the manual to see what they do and see how if your gauges are not expanded, if they only show what's in the video. Trimming the in and out points of the project changes how the data looks. So that might not be what you want. In that case, go to the export section instead and do the same there. Trimming the export here will determine the length of the video you export, but will not modify the data visually. And that's normally more useful. Since we are in the export section already, Know that there is a specific export tutorial with all the information, but some novelties are not covered there, like the experimental blast rendering option. That seems to enable faster exports, but at the cost of overlay visual quality and sometimes even reliability. It may be renamed to draft rendering on future updates. Next to the export button, we've got an option to save our current export settings as default, and then the option to add this project to the export queue instead of exporting it right away. One of the most useful features for professional video editors is exporting a transparent video. Once the export completes, we can load the original footage and the transparent overlay in a standard video editor like Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve and so on. This is not a tutorial about those programs, but to show you an example, we can create a new timeline with the footage. 
and that way we're not losing any quality due to repeated transcodings. And then we can place the overlay on top aligned with the footage. And it's already in sync. One thing you will notice is we've got two audio layers. We can potentially zoom in on them and use the audio peaks to fine tune synchronization. But once that's good, we can mute the audio from the overlay. Also, since the footage and the overlay are independent, we can play with the opacity of the entire overlay and bring it in slowly, fade it out, and so on. Or we can play with certain gauges independently. This will be different in each editing program, but let's, for example, isolate the speedometer from the rest of the gauges and then fade it out and fade it in at will. Of course, there are many more possibilities. You could move gauges around, but you will need to check the documentation of your editing program. Another interesting way to create a transparent overlay is with a data file alone, no video involved. So normally, we would start a project by loading a video file. But let's see how to start it with the activity file instead. We'll go to the general settings and enable video less mode. Now we can load the data file directly. This has a transparent background and it's as long as our activity is. So we can go straight to the export section, export the transparent video and finish our work in a standard video editor as explained. Telemetry overlay is compatible with endless data formats and devices, but in some cases you might need to massage your data to make it compatible. That's what the custom CSV format is for. For example, here we've got a report as an Excel spreadsheet. This is not compatible. So we'll go to the instructions manual and scroll down to custom CSV. Here's a minimal example of the custom CSV structure. And the most important column is a time reference. It could be a UTC Unix timestamp, the date and time as a text, time as milliseconds or time as seconds. There's also a series of predefined column names that will allow the program to understand the data it is seeing. And we've got some compatible units so the program can do unit conversion even if the column is not strictly compatible. First, we will remove all the unnecessary headers. We will create a time reference column necessary for synchronization, animation, and so on. In this case, we will use date because our file already has a date time column. So we'll just rename it. Now let's try to reproduce the GPS data by renaming its essential columns, LATDEC and LONDEC. It's important that the headers are exactly the same. We will save this as a CSV. And load it in telemetry overlay. And the data is there, GPS gauges work fine. But altitude is missing. So based on the instructions manual, altitude needs to be Alt-M. And it's optional. So we'll rename it. But the cells have units and we don't want them. So we will convert the column to numbers strictly. This process might be slightly different in Microsoft Excel or in Google Docs, so you might need to check their manuals. And then when we reload the data, the altitude data is there. We also have speed data, but it's only based in the coordinates. So for better accuracy, let's try to load the native speed data. It needs to be in meters per second, for now, the custom CSV format does not support kilometers per hour. So we'll create a new column. Call it speed meters per second. And we will look up the formula to convert kilometers per hour to meters per second. It's just this number. And we want this column to be a number. And we will use the formula to convert this to meters per second. But we need to get rid of the units first. So we will get the left part 
of the speed column, including the length of the entire cell, minus the five characters of the units, times the conversion to meters per second. We'll expand this to the entire column. Of course, this is a very specific example. Each unsupported data source will require its own little tweaks, but the general concept is the same. This can even be automated with scripts if you have any experience with coding. And when we reload the data, the speed data looks great. Some other columns that are not formatted as number will be available for the dynamic text gauge as we've seen before. So let's create some fake data. And there we go. It's true and false as we specified. We could create other columns with numeric data. For example, an increment. And let's give it units just to show unit conversion. So with custom versus time, we select the new column. It shows all the data. And it can be converted to our favorite units, as long as we specified compatible ones. And it's important that the CSV format is separated by commas, so no other commas should be included in the cells. Use a dot for the decimal separator and so on. Once we're happy with our result, we'll go to the export section, but this time instead of exporting our project directly, we'll add it to the export queue. We can rename it to remember what it was. And then say we're working on a different project that we can add to the export queue as well. Again, we can rename it and then sort them based on whichever is more urgent. and finally export them all. And of course, one of the advantages of the export queue is you can leave it working on many projects overnight and have them all exported in the morning. You can access the export queue without starting a project from the top right options. Let's clear the queue to show a different way to work with it. As we've already seen, we can select different sections of our project by trimming in and out points in the export section. We can add those to the queue And I'm using the I and O keyboard keys for in and out points. Adding to the queue. And finally, a section from the end. And instead of exporting three separate projects, we can decide to join them as a single one. We can see their times, but we can also rename them for clarity and sort them arbitrarily. We could also add a soundtrack file, normally a music background, and it will be applied to our joint video export. Or if we were not joining exports, the same audio would be applied to every one of the videos. Of course, this is not a fully fledged video editor. For serious video editing work, you will still need to use a standard video editor like we've seen before, ideally with transparent overlay exports. But combining some of the techniques we've seen, like static titles and images, trimming the exports, sorting the export queue, joining the exports and adding a soundtrack, we can kind of make basic video edits with data overlays in a single program. Still on the topic of joining multiple videos as a single one, it's important to note that many camera brands split long videos in multiple video files. Those video chapters or parts are consecutive because there is no time in between them. When that is the case, you can load them all at once in telemetry overlay from the initial video section, and you can even sync external data to them without problems. Telemetry overlay will join the video parts and their data. However, if you stopped and restarted the camera between each video file, those are not consecutive, and syncing external data to them will be problematic, because the data will only be in sync with one of those clips. This is not a deal breaker, but handling these cases requires some more steps we will need to create separate projects and join them in the queue. We will see a difficult scenario first to understand the process, and then an easier way to do it. See here, for example, how we've got a single activity file and six different video files. 
We know these Go profiles are not consecutive because the last number in their file name is different. This is not the same for every camera brand, but with GoPro, a different last number indicates a new video. Same last number, but a different number at the beginning would indicate parts of a single video. So we should not load all these files at once from the initial video section. Instead, we will create a project for each one of them. Once the video imports, we can rotate it from the project section if necessary. We will import the data file. And in this case, the video doesn't have valid GPS timestamps, so the external data is not syncing to it automatically. There are many ways to fix this, and there is a comprehensive synchronization tutorial. But in this case, what I will do is sync the external data to the video timestamp, so that I know the offset is the same across all the videos, and I will apply an offset. This video has no easy references, but what I'll do is look for street signs, like this one, and then use the GPS path and the dynamic map to offset the data until we find that point. So using the offset, I will look for that position roughly in the GPS path on the left, and then with more precision in the dynamic map on the right. Once that's good, I will reapply the cycling pattern. and add the project to the export queue. Now let's do the same with the second video. Load video, load data, sync. I'm using the same offset from the first video. And add to queue. And we'll do this with every single one of them. But don't worry, this is the worst case scenario. In many cases, you will be able to automate much of this process. Once we have all the sections, we will join them as a single video as we've seen and start the export. To make this process much easier and faster, we will need to automate three things. Synchronization, our pattern, and the export settings. Synchronization will be different for every case, so check out the Sync tutorial and the GoPro GPS Signal tutorial. That way you will maximize the chances of synchronization happening automatically. One option is to keep an accurate camera time by regularly setting it before each activity or connecting the camera to its app. Once that works well, you can go to the general settings of telemetry overlay and allow the program to sync to creation time. Again, make sure your camera time is updated or otherwise this will be unreliable. And make some tests before you commit to this with an important project. Video times typically don't respect time zones, but in some cases they do. For example, if you use the Labs firmware from a GoPro, there is an option to keep GPS time, and that's a very useful way to keep a time reference for auto sync, but those times have time zones, so enable this option. That will work even if one particular video doesn't have GPS data, so have a look at that option, it's interesting. The next step will be to prepare a pattern. So we'll import one of the videos, Correct its orientation if necessary, which will persist within the pattern. Import the telemetry data. And work on our gauges. For example, we can remove power and distance because we already have altitude versus distance. And then create a zones graph. Let's pick power zones. which will show us the current zone and the time spent on each zone. Once our layout is good, we'll save the pattern as you know. We can call it batch cycling. And because we want to automate the process, we will select it for our default pattern. And now we will save our default export settings. Let's pretend we want a finished video but we want to use GPU encoding to H.265, which should be a bit faster and provide good quality for relatively small file sizes. The rest of the defaults are good, and we will save this as a new default. Now we'll open the export queue and choose the batch loader option. Now we can select all of our video files indeed. 
and the program will ask us if the files are consecutive or independent. As we know, they have time gaps in between because the camera was stopped and restarted, these files are independent. Now we have the option to add external data, which we will do. But first, we need to decide if we want to expand visible data or not. This means that even if we haven't expanded the data in each of our gauges in our saved pattern, the program will force that option so every gauge is based on the entirety of our activity. This will affect total distances, the complete GPS path, and the auto max and minimum values of many gauges. Since we are using a long external activity and we want every one of the video sections to reflect that long activity, we will enable this. And you could override existing exports if you are doing this repeatedly. Now we will select the external data. And the program is now automating the process we did before manually. It's creating one project for each video, adding the data, syncing it, applying the pattern, and adding it to the export queue. As you can see, all the projects are loaded and you can choose to join them and export them all as a single video with all your video sections and a single activity. I hope this was useful. It's been a long one, but lots of topics covered. If you've got questions or comments, you can leave them below. See you in the next one.